All right, Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. And we will also be taking a look at 1 Peter chapter 3. And at the very end, Psalm 44. So, Acts 19. 1 Peter chapter 3. And Psalm 44. <clears throat> Acts 19. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 3 and Psalm 44. Well... The theme of Acts, of course, is Jesus is still working. And he's still working, isn't he? You know, he's still working. And we've seen in, in Acts chapter 19 that God poured out his spirit on the church at Ephesus and uh, uniquely us last week as well, right? You know, God poured out his spirit upon the church at Ephesus and we saw the amazing work that God did for two years there in Ephesus as a result of that. And the tendency is to think that's it. You know, we've arrived, they've, they've got it. You know, that, that's what it's all about. But a spirit-empowered life is just one part of the equation, you know. The work of God's spirit is to bring us to a place of absolute surrender that will impact not just us, but the world around us. And so in the rest of this chapter, as we move on, we're gonna see the amazing impact Impact that their surrender, their, the surrendered lives, the spirit-filled lives that they had, had on Ephesus. And, and this is how God wants to impact our city as well. So we're going to pick it up here in verse 13 of chapter 19 of, Eph of Acts and uh, move on. So Acts 19, verse 13. Now, into this situation where God is doing these amazing miracles, unique miracles, and God has poured out his spirit and great discipleship is happening here, verse 13, we find that some come into Ephesus now to minister without the spirit. It says, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Now, these vagabond exorcists, they were traveling gypsies, so to speak. They would travel around, and they had this exorcism business, okay? They actually claimed to have special training passed down from Solomon, and they would use potions or charms or incantations to get rid of the demons. And so, for a hefty fee, of course, you know, you could have your demons removed, you know? And Jesus actually referenced them in, in Matthew 12, 27, because remember they said, he casts out uh, demons by the prince of demons, right? And, and Jesus said, well, if I do that, then what, by what power do your sons cast them out, you know? So he referenced these guys in Matthew 12, 27. Well, as word was spreading of all the amazing things God was doing, they thought that they would add the name of Jesus to their repertoire. It says that they now, it says they took upon them, they began to attempt to call over them which had these evil spirits now the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, and this is what they'd say, we abjure you or we command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. No doubt having heard the stories of how God had used Paul to genuinely set people free from demonic bondage, they added Paul and Jesus' authority to their incantations. And this became a common practice in the area until something a little crazy happens in Ephesus. Verse 14. <clears throat> and there were seven sons of one Siva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. So we find this guy Siva, or Skiva, he was a high-ranking priest, <clears throat> a Levite, visiting uh, Ephesus with his exorcism business. And, and so there was one of these guys, and he did so. He was starting to use Paul and Jesus' name. But there was one problem he encountered now in Ephesus he actually encountered a real demon <laughs> instead of just, you know, you know, huckstering, you know, and doing his thing. And so in verse 15, it says, <clears throat> they did this, and the real demon answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> the scariest night ever. <laughs> It's never a good thing when the demon answers you instead of the person. Not a good thing. And so the spirit answers and says, Jesus, I know him. And Paul, I'm familiar with. 
But, and literally in the Greek, it means, but you, who are you? Who are you? You know, Jesus said, all power and authority is given unto me, and he is with us in the world. We never have anything to fear from the forces of darkness, but a man apart from Christ surely does, surely does. Messing around with the occult is one of the most dangerous things an unbeliever can do because they are severely outmatched. Verse 16, so the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I mean, the dude, this is how fierce it was. He's pounding on them, ripping their clothes off, and they're just running out, and they're not naked, literally. The idea is they're in their, in their civvies. <laughs> so an event like that, of course, you see a bunch of guys running around in their underwear, you know, and they're, you know, they thought, isn't that the traveling exorcist gypsy guys? <laughs> Is that a new show? You know, I mean, is that, you know, and, and, and that would immediately draw attention and the news would spread. And sure enough, it did. Verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks that were also living at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. When this happened, a great reverence for God came upon those people all throughout the city. You know, <clears throat> there's the mocking of God that people do. There's the making merchandise of God's people that false prophets do. But then there comes those times when God moves in reality and there's a sense of reverence. You know, when 9-11 happened, I distinctly remember the attitude of so many people. Our church was full that day. It was full that, that next Sunday. It was full. People had lots of questions. Why, what happened? How did this happen? Why did God allow it to happen? Is there a God? I want to find out about God. I need to know about God because it was very rare for you to interact with someone who didn't at least know someone who was touched by that horrible, tragic event. There are things in life that occur that cause us to kind of wake up a little bit and to ask the question of, okay, I've been kind of going through life and kind of doing my own thing and, and whatever, and this doesn't fit into that plan. This doesn't fit with that at all. Many of us watched on live TV as those buildings came down and it didn't fit into anything about our regular selfish, self-centered day. That whole event just ran counter to me living my life and doing my thing. And this is kind of one of those things in the city where they just kind of looked around and you thought, okay, there's a real God out there and what I just saw does not fit into the way I've decided to live my life. It's very similar when Ananias and Sapphira died for lying to God, you know? Could you imagine what would happen in our city if something like that happened, you know? We had offering time, and then somebody just keeled over, you know? Or, you know, if, if, if in some church somewhere, you know, you had someone who was, you know, having an affair, but they were in the pulpit, and they just keeled over, you know? Somebody said, you're having an affair, and the Lord's going to take you. Boom, and they go down. I imagine it would be in the news, and I imagine it would cause some people to think. There was a line, a clear line drawn here between the fraudulent and the real, the truth and the lie. And these events tend to wake people up who are wayward, knowing they have no business being where they are in their backslidden state. Verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. These are the ones who had already believed. These were believers now. He said, wait a second, I thought, I thought God's doing awesome things and he's poured out his spirit in Ephesus and, and, and why are the believers coming and confessing and, and showing their deeds? In fact, the word came means they kept on coming. We're not sure where they came or at what time they did this or if we're, how it started, but it was a spontaneous move here. Amongst the Christians, as God's spirit brought conviction, they saw that there was the fraudulent and that God dealt with the fraudulent and looked at things in their lives and they knew that there was hypocrisy. They knew that there was sin that hadn't been dealt with. And so they came and they confessed, it says, and they showed their deeds. The confessing and showing is a Greek idiom that means to openly declare one's deeds from top to bottom. In other words, nothing kept secret, no more hiding. No more compromise. 
These believers came forward and they began to confess their sin. They began to make openly declare all the things that were going on in their life that had no business being in their life. These believers laid it all out there. I remember, if you've never read a, a good biography, Keith Green, um, <clears throat> who's a controversial individual, um, there were times that they're saying, you know, you read about it and you're like, okay, that was a little odd. But, um, but one of the things that was fascinating about him is he felt like, you know, the part of what happened in the church is that we, we had, we'd, kind of put this cocoon, this spiritual cocoon around each of us, and we, we kind of came to church, we just did our thing, and, and we left. And, and so when he would have his worship concerts, so they'd invite him in to come share, he would have these times of just open confession. He'd open up the microphone, and people could come up and confess, you know, whatever sin they were, they were going through, and they just wanted to get it out in the open. And, and God, in, in many of these venues, would pour out his spirit, and, and there would be great revival that would occur. And here we see something very similar to that where these believers lay it all out there and it results in a forsaking of their wicked deeds. Verse 19, and many of them also which used curious arts or they were basically witchcraft is what they were involved in. It says they brought their books together and they burned them before, <clears throat> pardon me, before all men and they counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, this is more likely Gentile believers who had many superstitious practices that went with their idolatry. And after some of these Gentile believers, after they had given their lives to Christ, they had held on to these things afterwards. They hadn't let go of them yet. And so they had a lot of these, you know, superstitious things in their homes, a lot of these superstitious practices that they still did. And so they brought this out into the light and it says they brought those things, those books, and they burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and they found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. That's the equivalent of $10,000 of materials. It's a lot of books. <laughs> now, one thing I want you to notice, they didn't go run, the Christians didn't go running around town demanding that the unbelievers burn their books. They didn't go running around town and, or breaking into libraries and burning books, nor did Paul tell them to do so. It was spontaneous from the Christians who were doing things that they knew they shouldn't. Which brings it now 2,000 years later down to us. What secret things in our lives need to be brought into the open and burned? I don't need to give you any suggestions because if you have anything <laughs> like that in your life, the Spirit of God is putting his finger on it right now. He's putting his finger on it right now and saying, this needs to go. This needs to stop. You know, when I was a young believer, I had a lot of issues. I, uh, I came from an occult background. All my friends were involved in witchcraft and, and so you know, I didn't get deeply involved into it in the same way that they did, but that was my background. And... Um, when I got saved, you know, I was like these guys, you know, I still kind of did all that stuff and, you know, it's still kind of a part of my life, but I love Jesus and, 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 and I was very ineffective in my witness. I was very ineffective in my, my, my Christian walk. I, I didn't find a lot of freedom in my walk with the Lord. I struggled a lot. Every Sunday was kind of like one of those Sundays where you, you come dragging in, you're like, all right, pastor, and, you know, fill it in again because I, I ran out about Wednesday, you know, and, and, uh, and, and you know, just kind of, you're just trying to, trying to hang on. And, and there were times in my life that I almost wished, I dreaded, because I was afraid, you know? I was afraid someone was gonna, you know, get up and say, and there's someone in sin here, and he'll point to me, and you know, but there was also a part of me that I almost hoped they did. So I could just get it all out there. And they would know, and, and it'd be out there for everyone to see, so they could, I could get it done with finally. If you have anything the Spirit of God is putting his finger on right now, you have to bring it out into the open got to get rid of it. But I'll be embarrassed, you might say. You know, these guys had one of the most amazing pastors to ever live in Paul, but they still had these secret sins. There's a lie that the enemy shows to us. He says to you, see, you, know, you don't understand. You shouldn't be doing this at all. I mean, you're a Christian now. You know better. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be living this way. So, so don't let anybody know because nobody else is doing that. Nobody else struggles like this because you're just kind of one of those kind of sort of Christians. 
And God really doesn't have a plan for you and God really can't use you. And so this is just how you are and who you are and what you'll be forever. If anyone had to be a reason to be embarrassed, it was these guys. Who was your pastor? Paul the apostle. Oh, what was your church struggling with? What did he preach about a lot? Well, he was still kind of like to hang out with like, you know, witches and demons, all that kind of stuff. That nothing much, you know. <clears throat> but the beautiful thing is none of that stopped them. Obedience from the heart never needs convenience to enable its undertaking. Obedience from the heart never needs convenience to enable its undertaking. Do the right thing. Because you know what? That's how we're going to change the world. That's how we'll change our city. Look at the result, verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Just as those, that demon overcame these unbelievers, you know, that were trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus and Paul without knowing Jesus, the word of God overcame and conquered. I want to see the word of God prevail in our city, don't you? God help us. It starts here. Revival starts here. An impact starts here in our hearts as we say, God, no more secrets, no more things hidden in the dark. I want to come out and I want to make it known and clear. Verse 21, after these things were ended, this awesome work of God and the word of God is spreading and prevailing in this area. It says that Paul purposed in the spirit or in his attitude, in his own mind. He had planned in his own mind that when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, then he would go to Jerusalem saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. So Paul had a plan. He was not going to stay in Ephesus much longer. He was going to go visit the churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Corinth, then go back to Jerusalem, and then from there, make his way to Rome. And so, verse 22, he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timothy and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. Now, Rastus, this is our first uh, mention of him here in the book of Acts. He was one of the treasurers at Corinth. When he got saved, he became one of Paul's assistants alongside Timothy. And his name appears only three times in the Bible, but all of those three times we see him serving right alongside Paul. And you know, some wonderful brothers and sisters are called to do something different than what you and I are doing, but then God brings some who are called to labor side by side with us. And aren't you thankful for the people that God brings alongside you in life? You know, I'm always sad when God takes someone away, when he sends them somewhere else. And I think, well, I need them here. You know, I need them in my life, you know. But sometimes God does send someone somewhere else. But I'm so grateful and thankful for the people God brings alongside in my life, you know. Paul, his plan was to stay here for a short time in Ephesus, and he explains why he stayed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, we believe he wrote that book from Ephesus at this time. And so it says there in verses 8 and 9 of 1 Corinthians 16, but I, tarry, I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries." Through this revival in the church, God had opened a massive door to minister in Ephesus. But as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, there were adversaries, verse 23. Now at that same time, there arose no small stir about that way. In other words, there was, King James is always very polite. So that means there was a massive commotion or disturbance about the way. Now that was the early name for Christianity. Um, and Luke is about to describe to us what this commotion was about. Verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed whom all Asia and the world worships. 
It's always a bad thing when your, your God can get voted out. <laughs> when no longer has the ability to protect himself or herself. You know, I want to say it's Psalm 103 where the Lord, it may be the wrong one, so don't, don't quote me on it, <clears throat> where um, the psalmist says, you know, that these gods, they have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have hands, but they can't help. They have mouths, but they can't speak. They have feet, but they have to be carried around in a cart. And then it says, they that worship them are like unto them. That's what happens when you worship a, an idol. You become desensitized. You know, you become less than what God intended you to be. Well, these guys, they, they don't get it. This Demetrius, he's a trade guild leader of high-end shrine dealers. Now, these were small models of the temple. They'd put a little statue of Diana inside, and people would set it up in their home, or they'd wear it as an amulet, you know? And, uh, you know, that's some seriously big bling, I guess. But um, poor worshipers would buy terracotta shrines, but the wealthy would buy silver ones. So these guys are dealing with the wealthy. These are the money makers. And sales were always highest during the great festival to Diana in the month of May. Now, what's interesting about that is Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 16, 8, that his plan was to stay through at Ephesus through the Feast of Pentecost. Now, the Feast of Pentecost was last Sunday, by the way. I didn't realize that until someone pointed out to me afterwards. I thought that was kind of interesting. But Pentecost would be at the end of May at the same time as the festival. So it is likely the adversaries that Paul anticipates are from this guild. With sales dropping due to all the people getting saved and giving their lives to the Lord, they'll want to make sure that this is still a big payday. And so he says, he calls all these guys together and he says, guys, this is how we get our money. This is where our income is. And you have seen and heard, not just at Ephesus, but this guy, Paul, he's persuaded people to turn away from our business, to turn away saying that they are not gods, those which are made with hands. Verse 27, so that not only our craft is in danger to be set at naught or to fall into disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised or reckoned as nothing. Reckoned as nothing. And her magnificence should be destroyed, literally dethroned. Dethroned. I long for the day when every false god will be dethroned. Long for that day when the light of the Lord will reign. <laughs> now, lest we minimize the reality of who this Diana, uh, the impact of the goddess Diana, uh, Pausanias was a Greek traveler and geographer. In one of his numerous writings, uh, he mentions that Diana of Ephesus was worshipped more than any other deity in the world. And can you imagine anything more awesome than seeing that threatened by the message of God's love through Christ? You know, what's most worshipped in our culture? A lot of things. Wouldn't it be awesome if the main key issue, you know, what's the main key issue in politics right now, right? It all comes down to money now, right? It's all about money. We all vote with our wallet, you know? Who's going to keep it full? Who's going to keep it, or who's going to keep the government from taking money out of my wallet, you know? I'm, I, it is heartbreaking to see Christians very often rally behind individuals solely for the purpose of their wallet. We will support and we will throw our support and our, 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 our encouragement behind individuals who are immoral people, who are not good husbands, who are not good fathers, who don't manage their own money well, who don't live moral lives, but because we just want less government. I made, a, I made a commitment to the Lord in my heart about eight years ago. No, it was 12 years ago. And I would no longer cast my vote for someone I didn't want my kids to grow up and be like. I would no longer do so. They say, well, you're just part of the problem. You, you, you're, you're, you're a, vote for, a vote against, you know, for not voting for someone else is a vote for the person that's even worse. Listen, the nation that forsakes righteousness, God will judge it doesn't say that God will be with the nation that chooses the lesser evil. If we have any hope, any hope of doing that which is correct, we need to stand for what is true and what is right. 
because all too often we are alienating an entire half of our nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we support those who are just as wicked as the other guys. I know that's not popular. I know that's not what some of you probably want to hear. But until we get back to what we're really supposed to be promoting, which is Christ and him crucified, we're not going to make an impact. We cannot hitch our wagon to political parties that have long since left the gospel. Our wagon needs to be hitched with our Savior. When true revival happens, it makes this kind of an impact on a city. We're not going to change things through the polls. We're going to change things through the gospel. We're going to change things through our own hearts being revived as we come to him. And the people around us are going, you know what? People aren't coming to the bars anymore. People aren't coming to the strip clubs anymore. People aren't living and, and, and investing in the human traffic anymore because you know what? They're not doing those things anymore. Don't we want to have that kind of an impact on our city? We can't lose hope. We can't just decide to say, well, let's just, just hang on. That is not our calling. That is the calling of the tribulation saints where it says, blessed is he who dies in the Lord until this is over. And if you hang on, praise the Lord, hang on. Our job is not to hang on. Our job is to win. Our job is to conquer. Our job is to plow a field, to lay the seed and to see God move. We have a task in front of us. And I understand, I get discouraged I see it and I get so discouraged and you just want to be like, why? Why even bother? <clears throat> but our call is not to just hang on. Our call is to win, to hold on, to hold fast and to hold forth and to call a wayward generation back to a loving Savior who has not given up on them, who shed his blood for them every drop that they might be redeemed. We have a great message because we have a great savior. Don't give up hope. <laughs> well, verse 28, when they heard these things, they were full of wrath. Oh, I can't believe this. This is horrible. And they began saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And they cried out, saying, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the, it's in the imperfect, which means they kept shouting it over and over and over again. And, and this, this type of a practice is very common in the emotional-laden uh, religious services of, of Hellenism, that Greek culture, the mystery religions. They would, they, they, well, I won't get into all the things they did, but the shouting was a very uh, a common part of their, their religious services. And so they're shouting this, great is Diana of the Ephesians, over and over and over. And so it says the whole city was filled with confusion. Now, that's a real bad translation. It means the whole city gathered themselves into this disorderly mob. And it says that they having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia who were Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So this big disorderly mob is kind of conglomerating and they latch onto a few of Paul's companions, no doubt looking for Paul but not finding him, uh, whom they dragged into that Remember I mentioned last week this massive theater, it seated over 25,000 people. Some archaeologists believe over 50,000 people. And they dragged these two guys into the theater. Now, this theater is where the gladiatorial games were held. Prisoners would be fed to the beasts. And, and so obviously upon hearing about this, Paul plans to go right in there, go right in there and talk to these guys because his friends are in there. And so verse 30 says, when Paul would have entered in, when he had planned to go in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. Now, you got to love Paul. I, I don't know what I'd do. I, I hope I would go, want to go in there, you know. But Paul always had this mindset, if I can just talk to him, God will do something, you know. If I can just get him in front of me for just a few minutes. Remember later on in Acts where Paul, you know, the, the Roman, uh, I don't remember, the captain or whatever it was that brings him up. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Paul says, hey, can I talk to the crowd? You know, and, 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 you know, you're thinking these people just tried to kill you. You know, and he's thinking, no, 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 if I just talk to him, everything will be good. Paul always had that mindset. If I could just talk to him, God will do something. And that simple faith is so necessary in a world full of pessimism, you know. You know, but we need caution too. Uh, Paul's stubborn optimism often led him into situations that even God told him not to go to. 
Uh, but we still need voices that will call for us to take risks as well. And that's why we have the body of Christ, right? Some of us are inclined to more caution, right? And some of us are inclined to kind of rush in where angels fear tread. You know, we kind of have to be reeled back in. The cautious ones, you kind of, no, no, come on, it'll be good, it'll work, you know? And, 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 you know, we balance each other out. That's important that we have both groups. Well, here, the one group, the cautious group, is saying, uh-uh, Paul. It says, they, the disciples suffered him not. Uh, the more Paul resisted, persisted in his wishes to go, the more the disciples refused to let him. It's, in, it's again, it's in the imperfect tense. They just kept going back and forth. Verse 31, then word came because certain of the chief of Asia, these would be the Asiarchs. Each, uh, each province in Asia had a, a, a Roman province had a group of 10 elected men who would supervise funds for, uh, that were connected to the public games and you know, the festivals that were in their region. You know? And uh, it's interesting, these guys are high-ranking officials which were his friends, that the gospel had penetrated this group of wealthy politicians. And so these guys who were his friends, they sent word unto him saying, please don't go in there, Paul. It is not good right now. You go in there, they're going to kill you. So they were desiring, it's stronger, it means they're begging and pleading that he would not go in there. And so in the end, and rightfully so in this case, caution won out. Because the truth is, God didn't need Paul. He had everything in hand. Verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing. So we're back in the, the theater again. Some cried one thing and some another. For the assembly was confused, you know? And the more part knew not why they were come together. <laughs> so there's this massive crowd and they're all there and this mob and they're all angry, but not everybody knows why they're angry, you know? You know? Why, what, what's going on? I don't know, but I don't like him, you know? And, and I, I don't like him either, you know? Too many taxes, you know? And, and just everybody's, you know, kind of just angry. And when a bunch of angry people are present, they're going to look to the nearest thing that makes them mad. And unfortunately, Satan has always hated the Jews. He has always hated the Jews, and he has created those prejudices amongst much people in the world. And so those prejudices now awaken anew. The Jews that were there, probably because they didn't like Paul either, and that's why they initially joined, they sent a spokesman up now to, to say that this riot isn't about them, but it's about the Christians. Verse 33. And so they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And we don't know who this guy is, but he's a spokesperson. Now the Jews have, you go for it. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and he would have made his defense unto the people. Listen, it's not, we didn't do anything this time. And, and you shouldn't be mad at us. It's the Christians you should be mad at, you know? But it doesn't work. Verse 34. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, for about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Wow. That would get boring after about 30 seconds. <laughs> now, the reason that they reacted negatively to Alexander is because the Jews hated idolatry as well. And it often drew the ire of the Gentiles around them. And so seeing him up there solidified the mob. When he comes up, they say, hey, we, uh, let me talk to everybody. You don't need to be mad at us. And, and, and oh, that's why we're here. Great is Diana, the Ephesians. And they just start chanting for two hours straight. Now, it's kind of silly to imagine a massive crowd chanting to this repetitive tune for two hours. But what they're really chanting is, you can't take my gods away. You can't make me change my life. I refuse to repent and bend the knee to your way. And you know, does that tune sound a little bit more familiar? There are huge, massive rants on social media. We're not going to follow your God. We're not, you know, how, you know. And they just go on and on and on and on, don't they? Not so different. You know, the world hasn't changed much. And this is why God commands mankind to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. To reject our own righteousness for his is a place that every unbeliever has to come to where they have to no longer say, great is Diana of the Ephesians. But as we sang this morning, God, you reign, you know, you reign. Well, <laughs> verse 35. And I always, you know, every time, I, you gotta like the King James for little blurbs like this. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, you know, I kind of picture, you know, this little guy, you know, coming out, you know, okay, guys, that's enough, you know. The town clerk here, though, is not some little, you know, accountant guy, and if you're accountant, no offense. <clears throat> 
He's the chief magistrate. This guy is the most uh, highest elected official in the city. As a free city, Ephesus uh, would always be able to elect its own officials who would work with the Roman proconsul who was over the entire province. And unlike Alexander, this guy actually wields some authority, and so he gets the crowd to calm down. When he had appeased them or restrained them or quieted them, it says that he said, you men of Ephesus... <laughs> What man is there that knows not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper or literally a shrine guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Now, he's referencing something that they would all know about, but that we, most of us, would not recognize. Ephesus' claim to fame uh, as the center for Diana worship stems from the legend that Zeus sent down her idol, her statue from the heavens, and it crashed right into their city. And, and that he had chosen there. You know, that's always a scary thing when God's throwing statues down at you. You know, I, I'd rather worship the Lord. He's never done that to me. <clears throat> but they, they had this idol crash into their city and, and that they knew that Zeus had chosen them to be the guardian of her shrine. And so uh, the magistrate references this to remind them, you know, of their own importance in the world and that there's no need for a pep rally. Uh, you know, and I wish most in the world were as rational as he is. You know, if I would say, you know, if, if, if there's no God out there, why are you so mad? Why, why are you so mad? Why are you so all bent out of shape about it? Let me be the ignorant peasant I am, you know? <laughs> but it doesn't work out that way, does it? Uh, you're really mad at somebody you don't think exists. You're really vehement about his lack of character for someone who's not even real. I don't see people having rants about Santa Claus for breaking into houses. <laughs> the louder you have to shout to make your point, the closer you should examine to see if your point is wrong. And he's explaining to them, Why, what are you doing here? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. He says, you ought to bring yourself under control. Don't do anything foolish. For you have brought hither these men which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Now that's interesting to me. The, church, the Christians at Ephesus didn't say nasty things about Diana or the people who worshiped there. Now we know that Paul talked about sin and the wrongness of idol worship and the behaviors that were associated with it. In his letter to the Ephesians, he spends almost all of chapter four and five talking about not living their lives as other Gentiles who have an idolatrous mindset. In Ephesians 5, 17, Paul says, wherefore be ye not, no, I got the wrong verse. He says, be ye therefore not partakers with them. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So he had spoken about that. So how did the Ephesian Christians have such a good reputation in the city? Well, it goes back to the revival that we saw earlier. They were inward focused concerning sin. Revival doesn't start by picketing a gay parade. That is not where revival starts. It starts in my own heart as God deals with the ugliness of sin in my heart, of my own sin. Revival starts, if I'm going to make an impact, it's not going to be by picketing some, you know, rock person or, or some, you know, politician who blasphemes the name of the Lord. It's going to be me getting on my face before God and saying, Lord, what do you want to deal with that's right in this blasphemous place right here? What do I need to picket that's in here? that you might change me. Yes, the Christians made the silversmiths mad, but overall they were respected in Ephesus. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to close in just a bit. 1 Peter 3. First Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Peter says, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? I have found that in my life, whether it's in the work environment, the neighborhood, sports, all my kids played sports when they were little, and so, you know, I, I coached and stuff. And I, I, people knew I was a pastor, and they knew I, I didn't swear, and I didn't do all these other things or whatever. And so, you know, my life contrasted with some others. 
But I found most unbelievers is if, if I was a hard worker and I, I, I had integrity and, and, and I, I lived up to my, you know, I didn't, wasn't a hypocrite, that, that most of those folks, they, they didn't have any problem with me, you know? Now, some people did because they got an ax to grind and they're angry at God or whatever it might be. But for the most part, most unbelievers were rational around me and they, they were curious about times. So why don't you do that? Or why, why this? Or why that, you know? And we would have great conversations. But he goes on, he says, but an if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you. And don't be afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you, like they should or would, or would of evildoers, that they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation or life in Christ, you know? The idea here is that they were respected in Ephesus because of their lives. They didn't need to go out and bash the temple and bash the people that went there. You know, the Bible says our wrath doesn't bring about God's righteousness. And so often we lash out at the world for its ugliness, but if we haven't been dealing with our own ugliness and the world sees right through that ruse, we end up whacking them upside the head with a massive log that's still stuck in our own eye, you know? Like, give me, you got this speck in your eye, and you'll, we're just all over the place. The Lord says, deal with this first so you can genuinely help them. You know, I love that. You know, the Bible says, judge not. You know, don't, don't judge me. Oh, no, it doesn't. It says, me take care of my junk so I can help you take care of your junk. That's what it says. That's what it means. Judge first here so that you can help someone else there. If you want to make an impact, if we want to make an impact to really minister to the lost around us, we need to first deal with ourselves, to let God break our hearts so that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth can speak, out of the abundance of his love, mercy, and grace that we've experienced, his power, that we can then speak with power about sin, righteousness, and judgment, right? Well, verse 38, here's the conclusion. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, hey, the law is open. The court's open right here. And there are deputies. There are Roman officials here. You can let them in plead or accuse one another there. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, well, guess what? We will call an assembly about it. You don't need to start a riot. For we are in danger to be called in question for this, day, for this day's uproar, that being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse, there is no reason for us to be gathered here and now I have to go tell the Roman authorities what's going on. And so when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly and everybody left. So God took care of it without needing Paul to do anything, right? God knows how to save the righteous. He knows how to deliver the righteous. So anyway, we'll pick it up in chapter 20 next week. Well, this whole thing happened because of these Christians bringing forth those secrets. Secret sins, they have the ability to quench the power of the Spirit and to squeeze the life out of our living witness, even when the words that we share with others are right on. And so my encouragement to you this morning is let's live what we believe when it's only Jesus who's watching that our light might shine brightly from a hilltop. Amen? Amen. I want to read to you from Psalm 44, verses 1 through 4, as the worship band comes forward to close us out today. Psalm 44, verses 1 through 4. Would you all stand with me? My heart for our church this week has been that what happened last Sunday as God poured out his spirit upon us would not just fall by the wayside, that we would not just kind of go back to regular everyday living. And, you know, in Psalm 44, the writer there says, we have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work you did in their days in the times of old, how you did drive out the heathen with your hand and you did plant them, how you did afflict the people and cast them out. For they did not get the land of possession by their own sword, neither did their own arms save them. But it was your right hand and your arm and the light of your countenance because you had a favor unto them or you showed them favor. He says, Lord, I want to see you do these things again because it's you that does the work of bringing victory. And so 
in saying that, he says, you are my king, oh God. That's where it starts. Where do we start seeing that happen? It starts as individual lives say, Lord, you are my king. Don't let that secret sin thrive in the darkness anymore. Find a leader today. Find somebody. Go into the prayer room. Just, just find somebody to say, I need to get this into the light. I need to talk to somebody about this. This is what's going on in my life, and I don't want it to be a part of my life anymore. Would you stand with me in this and pray for me? Amen? Let's worship the Lord.